Energy Media readers, uh, welcome back to our 2019 Election Day coverage. And I'm very pleased to have Thomas Lukasik, who is the former Deputy Premier under Alice, uh, Premier Allison Redford. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Look, I'm really fascinated because you're, you've been on the inside of the kind, these kinds of discussions about how government functions. And in this case, it looks like we're headed to a liberal minority government, one which will be, have plenty of support from the, the Green, not the Green Party, but the NDP and the Bloc Québécois. And, and uh, so what, uh, what's your take on how that will play out for climate, federal climate and energy policy? Well, it's interesting because, you know, when I first got elected with Ralph Klein, we, we had uh, Chrétien, we had a liberal government in, in Ottawa. But the difference was that we actually got along with uh, Chrétien's federal liberal government, uh, ironically more so than we did later with Harper's. You know, Harper was always in a position where, where Alberta was a home territory. He didn't have to worry about any seats. Uh, whereas Chrétien, this was a, a battleground for him. So, uh, so the communication was constructive and, and often very positive. Um, now we have an ironic situation where we have a minority government, but strong enough to actually carry on for the next four years virtually on their own. No threat to votes of non-confidence. At the same time, we have a, a fairly large opposition that has no natural allies in the House other than just themselves. So even though there are strong opposition in numbers, they will not hold the government's feet to the fire. Uh, I think Trudeau has a carte blanche to, to carry on with his environmental policies, and, and they will be very much supported by NDP and, uh, and Green Party members, and in some cases, BQ. And, and in this particular case, uh, I mean, we saw a lot of climate policy. Uh, the, all four major parties had uh, climate plans that, that they released. Uh, three of them, the Liberals, the NDP, and the, and the Green, were considered very robust and, uh, and to get us to uh, net zero by uh, emissions by 2050. But there's been talk of if it's a minority government supported by the NDP and or the Bloc Québécois, that they would have pushed uh, Trudeau to go even faster on climate policy. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think Trudeau now has the numbers to deliver on his policies at his own pace. Uh, he frankly will not need NDP support uh, in that respect. Um, when, you look, when you look at the numbers of seats as it is uh, shaping up, and we're recording this at a time when, when final numbers haven't come in yet, uh, I think he will be the master um, of his own destiny when it comes to, when it comes to timing. Uh, I am more concerned about Alberta's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, how the seats look like in this province. You know, he, uh, he may not have any Liberal MPs uh, anywhere in this area. He definitely doesn't have any relationship with the Premier. As a matter of fact, it's a derogatory relationship with the Premier. Um, so he only has senators really to count on. Uh, to deliver can, I jump, can I jump in here for a second? Because I want to follow up on that, on that, your point about he has a derogatory relationship with, with Trudeau. Now, we've certainly seen Jason Kenney not been complimentary to Justin Trudeau. But Justin Trudeau has acted in, I think, the way a prime minister should. He's kind of, you know, smiled and, and he's not taken the bait. But are you, am I take, uh, understanding you correctly? You think that behind the scenes, there's some enmity between those two, and they're, they're really, the, uh, that's going to be a problem? Oh, very much so, a number of levels. You know, on a formal level, there's a, a, a well-established British parliamentary tradition that, that uh, we don't interfere in each other's elections. Provinces don't interfere in other provinces, federal and provincial and vice versa, because we understand uh, that in this system, at the end, we have to work with whoever happens to get elected. Uh, so that's sort of the formal stance, and it's, it's a well-held tradition. These, this time it has been breached. Mind you, NDP breached it in British Columbia uh, as well, which was unfortunate. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is this. Most intergovernmental relations happen behind the scenes, where a premier picks up a phone and calls the prime minister, or counterpart ministers call each other. Uh, they hammer out a deal, and then the bureaucracy inks the deal, and then you have a formal signing of some kind of an MOU or whatever it is that they're working on. That interpersonal relationship of, uh, of ministers with each other's offices and MPs working with MLAs is, is, is vital, it's crucial. Now, when you have a situation where uh, a premier of a province is actively campaigning, 
looks like you lost me here. Pick up where you left off. Okay. When you have a situation where a premier of a province is actively campaigning against the prime minister and his party, not only in his own province, but actually in other provinces, when you have a situation where a premier of a province is, is making personal allegations uh, uh, about the prime minister's competence and, and, and abilities and, 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 and whatnot, it's very difficult to rebuild that kind of a relationship. You know, politicians are supposed to be professionals, but like in any profession, there is a personal component. And I am sure that uh, Jason Kenney is the last person uh, at this point in time that, that Justin Trudeau uh, wants to collaborate with, work with, and, and, and hammer out deals. Also, Mark, why would Justin Trudeau want to lose any political capital anywhere else in Canada just to make, just, just to make Jason Kenney happy right now? Well, you uh, know what, Thomas? I, I've made the point uh, in columns and, and on social media that really the way that the, uh, the uh, Jason Kenney strategy was shaping up it absolutely required, and it could not work without a prime minister share. It exactly. was completely dependent on it. And now uh, it's not only are we going, it appears we're going to have a prime minister Trudeau redux. And, and on top of that, now we're going to have, uh, you know, an NDP uh, or a Bloc Québécois holding their feet to the fire. That seems to be the absolute worst case scenario. Uh, and it, it is not like it wasn't unforeseen. Yeah. Well, that's right. It was it was um, it was a winner takes all, and and in this case, um, you know, just uh, Premier Kenny was really hedging his bets. Um, for some reason, he was convinced that they will carry the majority, and then that would have been a good position for Alberta from that that one particular perspective. But at this point in time, Alberta is in a very untenable position because. Uh, we have opposition MLAs uh, who themselves also have been very critical and very combative um, in, in this election, which they didn't have to be because every single MP in this province is winning by thousands of votes. So they could have just sat back and, and be, uh, uh, be passive, uh, but they chose to be aggressive. So uh, we, we have a lot of work to do to build up this relationship. So what I think the prime minister will do, uh, on important matters like energy and environment, is he will be reaching out to senators. He has some uh, liberal and independent senators in this uh, case. I'm thinking actually about Paula Simons right now. Uh, she could be uh -huh. one. And, and he will be reaching out also to, uh, to politically engaged Albertans um, who have developed a relationship with, uh, with the Prime Minister's office um, to seek advice on matters of, of importance. Well, let me, I, I've got a, a, a pet, uh, not a pet peeve, but a uh, an argument that I've, I've made in, in, a, in a column that got a lot of uh, industry booster Al Albertans really angry with me. And basically what I said was, look, Alberta, it's not just Notley, Rachel Notley, that shook Jason Trudeau's hand and made a, a deal, the climate leadership plan for two pipelines. It was Alberta that made that deal. Right. And if Alberta chooses to break the deal, goes back, it gets rid of carbon pricing and, and guts the large emitter program and all of that, then really you've abrogated the deal. And That's you, right. And you can't expect that that isn't going to play out on in federal policy or support or the stuff that you want to do. It, it just makes no sense to me. Now, am I reading this correctly? Uh, you're, uh, you know, you were in government. What do you think? Well, you certainly are. You know, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, it, it, you know, it, people sometimes wonder why politicians are political, but you know, that's what politicians do. Um, and the fact is you serve uh, to make this place a better, uh, better place. But in order to do that, you have to get reelected. You know, so in the back of every politician's mind is how is this decision going to play out vis-a-vis -vis votes? And, and uh, Justin Trudeau has been shown yet again that no matter what he says or what he does, there are no political gains for him in this part of the world. Yeah. So he has to solidify his votes elsewhere if he wants to carry on delivering on his platform and on his vision for the future of Canada, which means uh, often uh, pleasing other parts of the, of the country, uh, perhaps at the expense of, uh, of Alberta. And, and that's, that's the untenable position that we put ourselves by always being so predictable in the way we vote. 
you know, Andrew Shear showed up over here only once, and, and he knew that it doesn't matter what he does or says, he has guaranteed votes. And Trudeau also know that even buying a pipeline, no matter how you look at that, uh, was not going to win him, win him any votes. I, I have another little uh, pet theory of mine that I'd like to get your, uh, your take on. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that uh, the industry uh, complains a lot about Justin Trudeau and the Liberals and they want to, I mean, we've seen some extraordinary statements come out of industry associations. Jeff Tonkin, the, the uh, chairman of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, said in a press release, a cap press release, that he believed the Liberal government was trying to kill the oil and gas industry to curry votes in other parts of the country. I, my jaw dropped when I saw that, and it should drop. Everybody's jaw should have dropped when a senior leader, industry leader, says that out loud. And here's where I'm leading with this, Thomas. I think that the industry, uh, never mind the politicians, the industry has played its politics very poorly. This is not about Alberta being the victim. This is about the leaders and the trade associations and companies playing their cards all wrong. They're, they've been bad politicians and now they're going to pay for it. What do you think? Well, first of all, they shouldn't be politicians. You know, uh, again, another tradition of, of industry associations is that uh, their job is to advance their cause no matter who becomes the government. And, and we have a, a little bit of a shall we say, perverted system in our province by the fact that we had a conservative, progressive conservative government in power for some 47 years. Um, so our associations, industry associations, didn't have to be political. They simply knew what the government will be, and it was rather predictable. Whereas in other provinces, I, I think they became more politically savvy, knowing that if they take sides uh, during elections, uh, they may find themselves on a losing side. Governments switch very often in other provinces. And that's what our industry associations are finding themselves in the middle of. The fact is that they have only one job, to promote their industry's um, aspirations with whomever happens to be in government at any time. My concern, Mark, is, goes a little further. Uh, I'm noticing that uh, for some reason, either willingly or unwillingly, uh, our oil and gas industry has subrogated its responsibility, its fiduciary duty to their shareholders um, and allowed uh, the UCP government to co-opt their communication. When you have a situation where the, the government sets up uh, uh, um, an association of its own known as the war room and starts becoming the official spokesperson for the industry, which now is veiled in, in ideology and, and partisan politics, um, that doesn't spell anything good for the future of the industry. Alberta energy industry has a good story to tell. They, they have a story of their own and they should be the ones in charge, of, in charge of that narrative. You cannot allow any political party, be it NDP, Conservatives or Liberals, to tell your story for you because those parties, their number one prerogative, prerogative is to get reelected not the, the, the well-being of your industry. Well, uh, Thomas, uh, you know that I'm a, uh, a very vocal critic of the, the Alberta Energy War Room. And uh, the, the, the last betting I saw on uh, Twitter was that you and I and Max Fawcett would be uh, number uh, public enemies number one, two, and three. In the war. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly hope not. Because, you know, I, I think most of us in Alberta appreciate the importance of our oil and gas industry. And, and most of us know that uh, even though there, there are valid reasons for criticism, there are many also valid reasons yes, for absolutely. criticism. Absolutely. Um, but those messages should never be political. There should be fact, best practices, science-based decisions. When, when now uh, the, the narrative of the industry is politicized, um, that will have an impact on not only the shareholders, but investors. Uh, and, and invest their confidence uh, from the outside of our province and outside of our con country. That, that, I want to follow up on that because you probably read my column of a couple of days ago where I basically said the same thing with, uh, within the context of Greta Thunberg coming here, which is at some point in the game, Wall Street and Bay Street are going to look at Alberta and wonder, where are the adults? Where are the adults that are running the industry and running the government? Because the, this, I, I just can't see this as being tenable. 
I, I mean, I wrote a column about, about Tonkin himself, right. uh, and I said, who would lend a CEO a, million, a billion dollars who thought the government was out to get him? That's right. You know, if, you're, if you've got a paranoid CEO that thinks the government's trying to sink his company, would you lend that company a billion dollars or, a, you know, I wouldn't lend it a buck for a cup, wouldn't buy it a cup of coffee. And, well, and this is the position that the industry, aided by, you know, the, aided and abetted by, by the, the UCP. I, I can't say this enough, House, and I can't say it too strongly. The industry has really put itself in an awkward position and doesn't even realize it's in an awkward position. I think some do. You know, I, I, I see some very positive and encouraging comments, for example, from the CEO of Suncor, um, who, who brings a, a lot of balance to the conversation. But, but I agree with you. Overall, the messaging has been co-opted. And, and we're seeing signs of it. As you know, underwriters are, are pulling back their coverage uh, for our operations. But, you know, when, when I was um, conversing with Albertans, uh, often I would hear where, uh, comments like, well, where will they go? The oil is over here. Well, that is true. But what we need to be worried about is the investment, is the capital. Uh, our oil companies uh, cannot do much without having sound investment, steady investment from, from abroad. And as the narrative of, of carbohydrates um, and, and climate change uh, is obviously catching on uh, worldwide, um, they will be second guessing their investments. And now, when you have a politicized uh, industry, um, you know, that, that, that is not a good situation. So, I certainly hope uh, that the leaders in the industry will pull back um, the public relations aspect of, of, uh, of their operations and start telling their own story and start depoliticizing it. No, you, you simply cannot have a GR and PR uh, juniors out of the legislature. Uh, telling the story of a multi-billion dollar industry headed by Tom Olson and, and you know, a, a fine guy, but, uh, but a columnist with a, you know, with a paper for a while. Uh, it simply doesn't have the wherewithal to properly convey the story, not just to Albertans, uh, but to the investors abroad about our industry. And, and I hope that we will see a shakeup on that front very shortly. And here's a, a, a an issue I, I made in a, again in a recent column, which is that uh, part of the industry's problem, and this is a really big part when we start talking about narratives and communications, is that there are two big the two biggest trends in, at the global level right now are the energy transition, so the transition from fossil fuels to uh, electricity generated by low carbon technologies and it is a thing unto itself it's driven by technology and capital and consumer right. and all of that the second is the climate crisis and industry never mind government industry is misaligned with those two trends there's too many climate deniers too many supporters of, of weakening climate policy there's too many hydrocarbon you know evangel evan uh, evangelists those kinds of things, they are misaligned. So the country is going, Canada, to bring it back to the federal level, Canada has, is clearly going in, in, in one direction and its uh, voters are clearly going in that direction. And that is aligned with where the you know, other international countries are going. And there's Alberta. And there my question, Alberta. Markham, will be, are they misaligned? You know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a division within the industry. Uh, as you said, CAP, uh, I believe, uh, by and large, represents the interest of small and medium-sized producers uh, who very much are politically engaged with the United Conservative uh, Party, um, tend to be very politically activist. And so the message that is loud, vocal, that we hear about all the time is that message. It's an aggressive, yes. political, ideological message. But when you actually look at volume of production, when you look at some of the larger oil sands companies and, and their executives and their boards of directors, you don't see them engaging uh, in this hyper um, active political partisanship. Uh, I think those larger companies are very much aligned uh, with uh, worldwide trends. They understand uh, where uh, the ship is going and, and they know that they need to adjust their practices to. Uh, to be relevant and prosperous into the future. So the question now is, 
how does the industry reorganize itself and allows some of the bigger players who tend to be more savvy on the political side and the communication side to take over the message? Well, you know, the reason I'm grinning over here, Thomas, is because I just wrote a book about exactly that very thing. And I made exactly those arguments. Uh, it was probably, you know, the New Alberta Advantage published in, in March. And, mm -hmm. and I, so I, I couldn't agree with you more. We're both singing from the same song, song sheet. But here's what I, what I would add to, to that to kind of round out the idea. And the problem is there was essentially after 2015, the climate leadership uh, plan, which, you know, the big oil sand CEOs were, were very supportive up on, the, up on the stage when Rachel Notley announced it. After that, there was almost like a civil war with, between those small and medium-sized companies and the big guys. And the big guys, I've been told by people who know that they basically got sick and tired of the fight and they just kind of threw up their hands. And that's, you know, 18, 20 months ago when you saw CAP do that hard pivot, hard to the right. That's when basically the, the big oil companies said, uh, we've had enough of this. We're just, we haven't got the stomach for this fight. And that's why you saw Jason Kenney on numerous occasions point his finger out at the CEO, those CEOs and say, don't you cross me. I will, I'll tell you how it's going to be. You remember those, those uh, comments that he made. I do. And so I, I agree with you. I think the big CEOs of the big companies have to reassert themselves and they have to take control of that, those messaging and those politics because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gotten out of control in the wrong direction. I agree. Well, on that note, Thomas, that's probably a good, uh, good uh, place for us to stop our conversation. This has been fascinating. First time I've interviewed you and, and uh, plenty of insight. So I'll be, I'll be knocking on your door uh, to talk, chat with you again. Thank you very much for this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Thank you.